Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous lecture I derived a quasi-linear partial differential equation which we can study with the method of characteristics to model traffic flow. So what I would like to do in this video and the one that follows it is look at particular solutions. And particularly what I want to do is I want to look at in this video fan-like characteristic solutions. So these are solutions that sort of spread out like a big fan as you're going to see or shock waves, which we'll look at in the next video, which are characteristics that sort of collide on each other and they sort of collapse and form these sharp singularities. So let's go back to our traffic model from the previous video. Remember, here's what we had. Partial P, partial T, plus C of P, partial P, partial x is equal to zero. This is our quasi-linear partial differential equation. In this case, c could be a, a linear or nonlinear function of p. It could be a constant, but whatever. In this case, it doesn't depend on space and time. Okay, so we would refer to this as a homogeneous equation. Now, remember from the method of characteristics that we've done a few times, characteristics, um, we have two equations that we need to solve. The first one tells us that along the characteristics, the solution does not change its value. So we're constant along the characteristics. And the second one tells us the equation for the characteristics, right? So if we follow a location in space according to some point in time, uh, in this case, you're going to get C of P. And so we can see here that our characteristics depend on the value of the solution P, right? And in this case, sometimes people call this the density wave velocity. So density wave velocity. So just a, a little bit of terminology for you if you'd like. Um, but essentially the sort of velocity part comes from the fact that this is the speed that you're moving along the characteristics. Uh, the wave is the fact that the characteristic transports you. And then the density here comes from the fact that it depends on the original unknown variable. Now, as I said, the first equation, so one implies that P of X and T is constant on the characteristics, on the chars, if you will. Okay, so chars, characteristics, just so that I don't have to screw up spelling char characteristics for you again. Um, so essentially, this tells me that my speed is also, is also constant on the characteristics, right? So the question is, what is the speed associated to each characteristic, right? Well, we have P of X comma T is equal to, well, P of X naught comma zero, which is just the initial condition X naught on characteristics, right? So X here would have to be a function of T. But essentially this tells you that your solution is just dictated, you know, your, your constant value of your solution is just dictated by the initial condition. And we've seen this, right? We've seen this a bunch of times, right? If you just take uh, these, if the C was constant, everything would just be transported at the constant speed C. So now what this tells me is that the characteristics are given by this. C of the initial condition at a point x naught times t plus the initial point x naught. So the speed along your characteristics is determined by where you started. So what I really want you to appreciate here is that, okay, again, these are all straight lines. So it's not as complicated as some of the characteristic models that we've seen before, but they might have different slopes, right? So here's how you could think about it. If this is at a space-time plot and we try and put our characteristics on it, well, maybe for example here, uh, my slope is such that my characteristic might look like this. Whereas somewhere further out, 
The slope might be such that the characteristic looks like that, right? And so it's not just a bunch of parallel lines. It's a bunch of characteristic curves or lines that each have potentially a different slope. C could be a continuous function. F doesn't have to be a continuous function. We've worked with uh, discontinuous initial conditions before, right? So these have aside steps. So these don't even have to be sort of varying continuously, these slopes. Let me give you a specific example, okay? Let's look at a model of traffic flow, really, really simple one. Or sorry, let's just look at a simple example here before we start talking about traffic flow and what this means, where we do, let's just say C is equal to 2P. Just a fun, simple, little, easy one. And we'll see what this means for traffic flow in a moment. And let's also look at an initial condition. Here's my initial condition. It's gonna be three if you're behind zero, and it's gonna be four if you're ahead of zero, okay? Well, all right, let's just start plugging things in. The, uh, the characteristic equation here is gonna give me dx dt is equal to 2p, right? Which tells me that my characteristic curves, or my characteristic lines in this case, is equal to two times p of x naught zero, the initial condition, right? This is just my f times t plus x naught, which when I put this back into the solution, right? So following our method of characteristics that we've worked through a couple times now, this gives me the solution. It gives me uh, three if x is less than 6t, right? So the characteristics are moving, you know, this is the separation at zero, but all the characteristics are moving in space and time. And then this gives me four if x is greater than 8t. So the question is sort of what is happening, right? So if we sketch out these characteristics, maybe we'll put uh, maybe x equal to zero here, then We've got one line that is x equal to, uh, say, 6t. And we've got behind, everybody's parallel because the initial condition was constant back there. Whereas out in front, I have x equal to 6, uh, sorry, 8t now due to the initial condition, right? The 4 here getting doubled up. And out in front, all the characteristics are parallel to it. All right, so what's happening here is that the front, this part that has four of this initial condition, is getting transported faster than the back, which had a three, right? So this part's running away. And so then we have the big question to ask ourselves, uh, what about in here? Right? There's, there's clearly a gap that's missing in here, right? There's between 6t and 8t. And does the solution just not exist there? Right? Because originally the initial condition had a jump discontinuity at x equals 0. And you can see that that jump discontinuity creates a, a gulf, right? A gap. So how do we handle this? Well, one way we could do this is we could imagine the following, okay? So I'm gonna sort of squeeze this in. I'm going to think of this as a set valued function, okay? Very strange way to think about this. It's probably something you're not that familiar with. But in this case, I'm going to assume that this takes on all of the values between three and four when x is equal to zero. So that means that my, my initial condition looks like this. Three, everything between three and four, four, okay? So everything is represented here. It's not a jump discontinuity. This is a set valued function. And so essentially what happens there is that x equals zero, all of the values in this set start to fan out. And essentially, 
you get all of these characteristics. You get x of t is equal to 2p times t at x equal to 0, or uh, yeah, 4, 3 less than p less than 4. That is the sort of interval here. You can make it open or close, it won't matter. But essentially what that does is that fills in the fan-like characteristics. And what this says is that the function actually looks like this. It looks like x over 2t for 6t less than x less than 8t. And so essentially, the way you can think about this is that jump discontinuity, because the front is moving, like the, the part with the 4 is moving faster away than the part with the 3, it's no longer jump discontinuity. It's sort of sliding itself outwards. It's taking what was a jump discontinuity and making it a function again. And so what's happening in, in between here is the function is sort of being interpolated, right? So it was 4 up, a, up ahead. It was 3 way behind. And then there's this connection in between that goes all the way from 4 down to 3. And in this case, that connection is getting larger and larger, right? It's separating in time because the front part of the wave is going faster than the back part of the wave, right? The front part's running away. So the question is, how can we apply this to the traffic problem? So let's apply. And again, if you've ever had to sit in traffic, you will probably be familiar with this situation. Here's my model, okay? So it's not going to be as simple as this. It's not going to be 2p here, but it's going to be very similar. If you remember from the very end of the previous video, I derived a c function that looks like this. 2p over p max. So you might have to remind yourself with the end of the last video, px is equal to 0. And here's what I want to think of, okay? Here's my initial density, p of x0. And I'll, I'll show you what this means in a second. It's p max for x less than 0, and it's 0 ahead. Here's how I'm thinking about this initial condition. Sitting at a red light at x equal to 0. Because of the red light, there, are, there is no density of cars on the road ahead of the light, right? Imagine that it's a very long light, and so everybody who got through the light is long gone. But behind the light, we are backed up bumper to bumper, and we've been sitting there waiting for the light to turn green, okay? And so here's the situation that we're going to imagine. We are going to imagine that at time zero, that light turns green. Now what happens? You can imagine this, right? You know what happens because you've probably done this. If you were the first car, you see it turn green and you get excited and you start pulling away. But then the guy behind you has a little bit of a delay, right? Sure, he sees it turn green, but he's still got to wait for you. So he gets, the, the first one gets away and then there's a little delay where the next guy goes. And then the third person in line, maybe they can see the light turn green, but what they're focused on is the person in front. And so you have this sort of propagation backwards that slows people down behind the, the, um, behind the, uh, the, the red light. And so the fan-like characteristics, so we call these fan-like characteristics because you're fanning out. In this case, this gives the solution, which is going to be the following. So it's going to be full density for, uh, sorry, x less than minus u max times t. Okay, so this is the delay. You know, this is the delay time that it's waiting to get way back. Imagine this is a long, long line of red lights. You could also think of this as a train that went by that slowed people down. But then so these are the people who are still waiting to be able to move after the light turned green. Then you've got the fans. So you have P max over two times one minus X over U max. 
uh, sorry, u max of uh, times t, sorry. And this is the people who have been close enough to the light and are able to proceed. I think that went over for you if you're watching. Uh, this says minus u max times t is less than x, which is less than u max times t. And way up above, right? Uh, sorry. The density is still zero because the maximum speed was u max, right? So people couldn't get up to this point in space yet. Okay? So essentially, this is what the fan is. It's a red light. It's a train that went by, right? This is a nice way to think about uh, these, these transport equations. They do a very good job of modeling traffic flow. There's a long history of this, and it's for good reason, right? We can see that it actually models things that we experience as drivers, right, in real life. Now, what we're going to come back to in the next video is a look at shock waves. And this is sort of the opposite of fan-like characteristics. It's where everything gets crushed together instead of spreading out. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.